mathematical notion and by carrying out uh, rigorous experiments on the computer. Because that would be a lot of work if you do these proofs by, by hand uh, with pen and paper technology. So let me now come to the end. Summary of the results. Godlike, uh, the property of being godlike has been defined here in terms, in Gödel's work and the follow-up work, in terms of positive properties. Think of perfections as well. And positive properties has now linked here in the talk with the notion of ultra-filter. So in a sense, we have bridged between a metaphysical theory and a mathematical theory. <clears throat> and we have then distinguished two different notions of positive properties. The one that applies to intentional properties and the other one that actually applies to the extensions, the fixed ones in the current world. And then we found out that in the Gödel-Scott variant, which axiomatizes the P, the intentional properties, uh, we can show that those two notions actually collapse and that, that both are an ultra-filter. In Anderson's variant, they don't collapse, they are different, and only the, the extensional version is an ultra-filter. The extensions version is an ultra-filter. And in Fitting's variant, we have also the analogous uh, interpretation here, the P prime is an ultra-filter. Um, and this seems to be the way out to carefully distinguish whether you want to talk about the intentions or the, or the extensions of these this, uh, positive properties and what you exactly want to characterize as an ultra-filter to get out of the trouble with determinism, the modal collapse. So that's what we did. Modal collapse holds for Gödel's Scott variant, but not for Anderson and Fitting. They seem to achieve that in very different ways. Mathematically, however, their solutions appear closely related. So an interesting question, or um, what we can say now, what's my personal conclusion from that is as follows. So there are theistic theories which imply the necessary, exis necessary existence of a godlike superior being. That's what we've seen, we can prove that. It's a mathematical deductive theory, we try to axiomatize the notion of godlikeliness and we were able to prove there necessarily exists a godlike being. And we even have support for different ph philosophical positions. So if you like determinism, some philosophers, I know at least one who claims that Gödel might be very happy with the interpretation of determinism needs to be further discussed, um, then, then, then you can adopt the Gödel-Scott version. That gives you modal collapse, that gives you a deterministic view. And if you don't like that, then better go with Anderson's or uh, Fitting's versions. Uh, gives you a non-deterministic uh, view of the world. So for me, that means not, I mean, I, I still struggle with the notion of existence here, and we can debate that. Uh, but for me, that means that theistic belief is at least not necessarily irrational. We have theories which imply the necessary existence of God. We can criticize them, but we can also try to defend them. But what the existence statement really means is actually something that's relevant very much to this, this uh, conference here. But the interesting thing here is by adopting the notion of ultra-filters, we have been providing a link between a metaphysical theory and a mathematical theory. So for me, the interesting question is now, first question, relevance of existence results in the real world. And I'm not an expert to further um, comment on that. But the interesting question now is, if you attack existence results of a metaphysical theory like here, and I've given a link to a mathematical theory, and you accept it, for instance, for mathematics, that there's something useful in saying there exists a, uh, a an, an, uh, square root of two or so, um, then I'm a bit puzzled, because I've shown that there here is a connection between a mathematical perspective and a metaphysical perspective. Well. Uh, to conclude, I think I have, evi I have evidence provided in this talk for a central claim, namely that computers may in indeed help to sharpen our understanding of ontological arguments. These experiments I've conducted here would be very involved if you carry them out uh, with pen and papers, and they would be error prone. So computer implementations can help you here to work very precise in interaction with the system. And the approach I have been sketching here uh, seems to be particularly well suited. You could address that in other ways, but it works very well so far, and I've uh, uh, attracted also many other people, uh, meanwhile, to, to use that. Uh, well, and again, so um, there is interesting related work. Computational metaphysics is something that's relatively new. I think Ed Salter has coined the notion first, 
and uh, it would be wonderful to continue this work also with other philosophical arguments uh, along the line of what you have seen here. Thank you. That's the same. Thank you, Dr. Christoph. Any question? Yeah, questions? Um, thank you very much. And uh, aside from the beauty and strength of your um, argument, it seems to me that there is a, an initial point which is not at least clear to me, that this kind of uh, strong uh, logics is still based on a very irrational um, assumption, the existence of God. If you don't believe it, you don't even start this kind of work. And uh, alternatively, if you don't believe it, you will never care about this kind of work. And it seems to me that there is this internal uh, warm or inconsistency yeah. in this kind of arguments. Yeah, yeah. I think it was never ever the idea, and I think that has been uh, addressed also in the literature of Anselm in the first place to actually um, convince a non-believer of the existence of God. It was more or less a kind of um, yeah, his idea was probably more to involve a non-believer attacking him with his belief by getting him involved in a fruitful debate about such a theory. So he says, why? You know, where is the flaw here? Where can you attack it? Um, and let, let's debate. And I don't think that you necessarily want to convince a person uh, of necessary existence um, by, the mathem by, by, by this mathematical theory. That's also, the, that's also how I personally reacted to that, uh, I have to say. So I'm, I'm still struggling with what it means for the real world and, and whether it changed my attitude substantially. But what it definitely changed is that what, what I pointed out in the end, uh, this, 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 let's say, naive attack that all religious belief is necessarily inconsistent in some way, you can really involve uh, at that level in, an, in a very interesting debate. So I, I would reject that automatic, uh, immediately. But, but the exist so yeah, it, it doesn't, it doesn't the, the argument itself is probably not strong enough to convert, convert somebody in, an, in a believer. So that's, that's my, my, my personal feeling. But nevertheless, it's an interesting vehicle here. Um, uh, before I ask my question, I could just follow up one thing. Yeah. What uh, I think Christoph has shown maybe that even if the, there is no proof of God's existence, he's at least shown that it validly follows from the premises. So if you accept yeah. those premises, you'll have to accept the conclusion. Exactly. So if you have a beef with the conclusion, well, then you'd have to reject one of the premises. Exactly. So. So now we, we, it's a reduction of necessary existence of God to some assumptions you have to accept. You can also attack the logic eventually and say, um, well, there is some irrationality right. in that particular choice sure. of logic. Sure. But, but you know, you, you, can, you can make a substantiated discussion now or right. use it as a starting point for that. No. No. That it's not a circular argument anymore. I don't see that. So, uh, this is a great talk, and you summarized it really very nicely. So let me ask the question, given that a lot of cultures don't think that there's a unique God, could, sorry, yeah, sorry, given that a lot of cultures don't think that there's a unique God, what are the, what are the issues involved in preserving, so avoiding modal collapse, but not having uniqueness of, a, of God? So yeah. that would be an interesting investigation. What premises do you need to weak, weaken uh, if you, well, well, do you get a uniqueness already? And if so, what do you have to add? And 
what do you have to subtract if you already get uh, yeah. u uniqueness so yeah. that you don't get a unique existence? Yeah, that, that is a highly interesting question and I have been starting to play in that direction. Uh, so the claim here about monotheism was for the Gödel Scott version and I played and I, I, I used there Leibniz equality. So it also depends on the notion of equality. So it, it, it opens up a room for lots of experiments. What is the notion of equality you want to apply? And as a modal logics expert, you know that this is not so clear at all. So I have play, uh, apl um, applied different versions, uh, Leibniz equality, just a primitive notion of equality, and for those two choices, I wa was able to prove monotheism. You could now try further ones, and eventually, uh, depending on the notion, you can get already out of that. And I, yeah, yeah, and exactly, but you have modal collapse, so, you know. But now in the, under, in the other versions, I've just started doing that, and it seems to me that eventually we already have their situation where you don't necessarily have monotheism anymore. So I, I could think of, but this is now, talking out of the blue, it's not confirmed, um, that we have a situation that depending on the notion of equality you adopt, you have a monotheistic view or a non-monotheistic view. And that would be, of course, an, a very nice result because that would, uh, you know, open up, uh, you know, you could have trinity or multiple instantiations of a godlike being and, and also an abstract notion which is, is monotheistic and it would depend just on the notion of equality you adopt. But this is talking out of the blue, so that would be a further, further study to present. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, here, Ben, I have a question. It's a really interesting talk. So my question is related to the computational complexity when you, my question is related to the computational complexity, right? When you solve it using a computer, yeah. because most of the SAT solver, kind of whatever we use currently, yeah. are uh, NP-complete. Yeah, they're not right. even, yeah, 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 right. So, right. Th so, that's, that's also so just thing. wanted to know, you know, yeah, yeah. what kind of pattern you see in terms of time complexity. Yeah, yeah, wonderful question. So, uh, I, I very much like to talk about that issue. Um, so, yes, uh, we are not even in NP-hard territory here. We are in undecidable territory. So, not even semi-decidable, we are in, in essentially in higher, in higher order logic, so um, we are in, in undecidable territory in principle. Um, nevertheless, we adopt in the background the notion of Hankin semantics, and that gets us in semi-decidable um, territory again. So, but, but still, I mean, uh, if you go to an introduction to theoretical computer science lecture, then you will be taught that, oh, this is already NP-hard and even beyond, so no hope that this is you know, practically feasible. Well, but meanwhile, we have many applications out there, in, in, in particular in artificial intelligence, where we very, very successfully attack problems which are way beyond NP-hardness. Um, and here we just have another example that computer technology, even though we are in very hard territory and that in principle I can't guarantee you that the systems terminate, nevertheless respond very well on practical exercises. I have done other exercises, for instance in deontic logics, it gets way more harder. These logics are, are more subtle, you have neighborhood semantics and so on, it's get, getting harder to, to get this uh, feedback. But here in the context, I very often had, uh, or in, in 95 or even higher percent of, of responses uh, to conjectures you make, you get either a theorem or you get a counter model. So that's a very good interaction with the system. And the counter models are highly valuable because if you do this, this typing, then very often you make mistakes and then the counter model finder tells you exactly what you have to look at. So they guide you in the, in the further experiment. So this, this interaction has been fruitful despite uh, the, the, highly, the high complexity of the, the territory we are in. And it, it simply means that, you know, uh, meanwhile, even in such challenging applications, computer technology, also automated theorem proving technology, has come to a point where it can compete with humans in the level, you know, in the granularity of the arguments we typically make in a paper. So my claim is it's already up to that stage and we can use it to verify on, on that level. We have proof sketches and we want to verify them or refute them and for this it seems to work. Thank you so much, Dr. Christoph. So please join me to um, thank Dr. Christoph for a wonderful presentation and a round of questions. Before we introduce our next speaker, I'd just like to share with you that we'll also take questions from WhatsApp, like what we did yesterday for Professor Heng's lecture. So if you're shy to ask a question, you could send your questions on WhatsApp, and we'll put up that on the screen right now. 
So you could send in your questions on WhatsApp or via SMS to the number. Uh, at the same time, you could, we could also, we are, we also take face-to-face um, -face questions uh, from the floor. Uh, besides that, this, this conference is also being uh, streamed live on YouTube, and uh, you can share that with your friends. It's on, if you go on YouTube and you Google 11 AISSQ conference, 11th AISSQ conference, you can see that live on YouTube, and you can also see the previous sessions that have been um, uh, recorded uh, the pre yesterday, actually. So um, that's, that's that. I just have a point to, to raise, actually, um, Dr. Zalta's question just now about um, the existence of uh, the uniqueness of uh, div divinity uh, based on Dr. Christoph's presentation. That's, that's interesting because perhaps science could present um, a, a, a resolution uh, between the different faiths. You know, they are all fighting about whose God is unique, etc. And science could, uh, mathematics could prove that um, actually we are fighting over nothing, much ado over, over nothing, actually, and because it is just, just one. So thank you so much again. So uh, we'd like to now, please note the number on screen, uh, plus 918240819460. That's, you can WhatsApp or you could um, SMS your questions. And those who are watching on YouTube right now, you could also WhatsApp your questions, and that could be taken. Um, and if you're on YouTube, if you want to share with your friends, it's 11 AI CSQ conference, and you can see that on right now. Yep. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Once again, would like to request you if you're having any question, or if you want to share the link, then please do share your link with all your friends. Uh, that that's going to be more wonderful. So now would like to move to the next and the next topic is uh, mathematician L E J Prabhu's philosophical view and the uh, Bhagavad Gita and for this would like to request to come on to the stage Dr Ten Coaster so please kindly join us on the stage uh, from VU University Amsterdam I would like to give a short introduction of uh, Professor Ten Coaster <laughs> Professor Ten Coaster raised in uh, Dodect in a mathematician and philosopher specialist in history and philosophy of mathematics. He is attacked uh, as an associate professor at the Faculty of Science of the BU University, Amsterdam. In 1991, he published a book about the philosophy of mathematics of the Hungarian English philosopher Imre Lagatos. Uh, with the French historian Luc Bergmans, he compared a detailed historical story on the relationship between mathematics and religion under the title Mathematics and the Divine. He wrote several articles about the role of geometry and uh, in mechanical engineering. In 2016, together with the Marilyn Albert Rust, he published the study Shooting, the, Shooting on the Moon, Authority of Resistance in Learn and it's in World War II. Shooting the Moon tells the story of Second World War on the basics of the events in learned at the time. With Ineke history he and Albert Rose, he wrote the uh, 2017 edition, Das Slag on the Berg Skating. The Battle of the Mountain Foundation tells the story of Holocaust on the basis of what happened to the learned-based Jewish children's home, the Berg Foundation. So let's welcome Professor Tain Kotz. very much. Uh, the, f the first talk was great, absolutely great, which uh, creates a challenge for me. You know, I prefer a lousy talk preceding mine. That's much better. I'm going to talk to you about uh, a famous Dutch mathematician. And first I would like to, well, e explain to you that he's indeed a, a famous math mathematician. In the Netherlands we do have three looking historically three famous ma mathematicians. There's Simon Stevin, but we share him with the Belgians because he came from Belgi from Flanders. Then we have Christian Huygens, and then we have L.E.G. Brouwer. And I'm going to talk about him. Um, well, in mathematics you do have, I'll keep it very simple, you have uh, arithmetic, and you have geometry, and a lot more. Now. He is in particular famous for his contributions to topology and look at topology as some kind of generalized geometry. Um, maybe you've heard of his fixed point theorem. 
That made him famous. He, he made these contributions between 1909 and 1912, several fantastic papers, extremely rigorous. He's really one of the founders of modern uh, topology. Uh, however, he's also famous for another reason. Uh, he is uh, the creator of intuitionist mathematics, which is an original version of constructivist mathematics, and I would like to say something about that. Consider the natural numbers. One, two, three, four, five, etc. The last word was etc. What does it mean? Well, it means I can go on forever. And that's why we call the natural numbers infinite, an infinite set. Now, the word infinite in the philosophy of mathematics can have two meanings, and that's been a point of discussion for ages. One of the two meanings is that you mean actually infinite which means that you believe that all the natural numbers are actually there, in a way. They're real, all of them. So what you're doing when you're counting them, you're just pointing at them, one after the other. That's a belief in actually infinite. The other position is that you say, oh no, 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 no. These, the, the actual infinity doesn't exist. The only thing that exists is potential infinity. So when you start counting, you're in a way constructing the natural numbers. And you've got as many as you've counted. And then there are tricks to speed the counting up, 10 to the power 10, etc., formal tricks, etc. But what you've got is always finite, but it's unfinished. You can always go on. But the actual infinity is, doesn't exist. That, that, that's what the believers in potential infinity say. Now, the believers in potential infinity are the constructivists. And the others are, uh, well, I'm a Platonist myself, I believe in actual infinity, but Brauer didn't. He was a constructivist. And the funny thing is that for, for centuries and for millennia, there was this discussion now and then between the two sides. And as for the mathematics, it didn't really matter. They did the same kind of mathematics. Aristotle didn't believe in actual infinity, just potential infinity, and Plato possibly believed in actual infinity. I think he, he would have believed in it, considering his views. But as for the mathematics, there was no difference of opinion. Now, Brouwer is really the first who realized that if you reject actual infinity and just accept potential infinity, your mathematics changes. And that's actually, from my point of view, his main contribution. And he developed his own version of constructivist mathematics in which a considerable part of traditional mathematics is lost. That led to a conflict, famous conflict, between him and, and David Hilbert, etc. But I won't elaborate on that because I've only got 30 minutes till, or 27, till this terrible guy with a bell will intervene. So that's Brouwer. What am I going to tell you about Brouwer? Well, this is what I just uh, told you. I, uh, I will sketch his philosophical views because he was not just a mathematician, he was also a philosopher. A, in a way, a peculiar kind of philosopher, but definitely a philosopher. And I will sketch you the development of his philosophical, philosophical views and their relation with his mathematics. Now, as a 17-year-old boy, in 1898, he wrote and in the Remonstrant Church, he read a, a profession of faith. He did not accept the, 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 the profession of faith that was used in, in the Reformed Church to which his, his parents belonged, because he was a, a man who had very firm ideas coming out of himself. He, and, and he stuck to those ideas. So he wanted to write his own profession of faith, one he did believe in not the one others had written down. It's a very interesting uh, piece of, uh, of text. I'll read you some parts of it. What is the foundation of my trust in God? And then he says, for the only truth to me is my own ego of this moment, surrounded by a host of images in which the ego believes and which causes ego to live. So there's the ego, his ego, and there are the images. 
And he says, my life of this moment is my conviction of my ego and my belief in my images. This is directly bound up with the belief in that which is the origin of my ego and which gives me my images, which is therefore independent of me, something that like me, myself, is alive and which is higher than me, that something is God. So there's the ego, there are the images, but they must have a basis, they must have an origin, and that's God. And Brouwer believes in that God. This view includes my immortality, or rather it excludes mortality, for time as well as space are part of my images, of which my ego is completely independent. The images given to me contain in themselves, among other things, also the possibility of the existence of other egos, the possibility of the existence of other egos, with their own images, but these are not real. They are part of my images, and therefore of me. My images are my life. It follows that in the world surrounding me and part of me, I'm struck by its loathsomeness, and that I want to remove this, also from the human world. I can hardly call this love of my neighbor, for I don't care twopence for most people. Hardly anywhere in human society do I recognize my own thoughts and inner life. The human specters around me are the ugliest part of my world of images. This heavy stuff, 17 year old, and he never changed his mind, I would argue, basically. In 1898, Brouwer was what I call an epistemological solipsist who found only truth in his, his own mind. But he was also an ontological solipsist which denied the existence of other minds other than as suggested in the image, as the images in his mind. Now, an ontological solipsist is in an uncomfortable position because he basically degrades all other human beings to images. However, he is in this world, he participates in this world, he gives lectures, he becomes a professor, he proves theorems which others admire, etc. Yet, these other human beings he interacts with are only images, and most of them are ugly. This is an uncomfortable position. I, I, I was looking for images. So I found this one, excuse me miss, you've just disproved solipsism. There's no way my mind alone could have created something as beautiful as you. Well, just, I couldn't find precisely what I needed, but it's sort of an illustration of this uncomfortable, well, it's, it's easy to, to, to make it ridiculous, of course, solipsism. But Brouwer is a very serious man and a solipsist, epistemological, ontological. Ah, uh -huh, yeah. Then he goes to study at university. He studies mathematics and natural science. You, you, you study them together, but he concentrated on mathematics. And he read a lot. He read a lot. And at a certain moment, he was asked to give a series of lectures. Uh, he, they were published in 1905. And uh, they were given at, at uh, what's now a technological university in the Netherlands at Delft. And so he worked on these lectures, and basically he elaborated on his profession of faith. Again, a very ser a somewhat peculiar text, but very serious. And uh, Van Sticht, one of the biographers of, uh, of, of Brouwer, wrote, he was listening to the voice of his consciousness, studying the works of the wise, who in their search for knowledge did not rely on their intellect, but trusted their inner experience. The medieval mystics, Jakob Böhme and Meister Eckhart, and the Bhagavad Gita. So, listening to the inner experience, that's very fundamental in Brouwer. He was born as a man who wanted certainty, he wanted absolute truth. Where did he find absolute truth? Only in his own mind. Well, Life, Art and Mysticism was published. And, uh, but he read the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, my, uh, my image of the situation is the following. There is this, he's, he's 20, 21, 22 uh, years old, and he's reading these philosophers. His view is the, the view in the profession of faith, and uh, then he runs into the Bhagavad Gita. I, 
this is for the non-Indians, you, you all know this. But you, you must imagine Brouwer, he meets the Bhagavad Gita, and what does he meet? Uh, well, he meets a beautiful story, a, a, even an exciting story. There is this famous bowman, this famous archer, famous archer Arjuna, and he has a uh, coachman, a, a, a driver, the, a driver of his chariot, uh, and uh, he, they, there's about to start a war, an enormous war between huge armies, and the chariot is standing in between the armies. And Arjuna, who's a very important man, he actually doesn't want to fight, because the the, the leaders of the armies are related and many people will die, there will be lots and lots of suffering and it's all